What I want to do in this video is show you examples of sigma and pi bonding in real molecules to show you that modern computational chemistry, software, and methods still use this distinction between sigma and pi bonding in a very deep way. And to do this, I'm going to use the WebMO demo server, which is available free of charge at webmo.net slash demo. Let's go ahead and dig in. I'm going to go ahead and dig in here and log in with the guest credentials. Guest is the username and guest is the password. And once we're loaded in here, we're going to go to new job, create new job, and we're at the molecule builder. Now, knowing that we want to highlight sigma and pi bonding, I'm going to create a molecule that contains both pi bonds and sigma bonds. So let's throw in a double bond there. I'll throw on a couple of extra carbons. This is one butene. I'm going to clean it up, comprehensive, idealized, and this will add hydrogens to ensure that everything is neutral and optimize the geometry. So this is our molecule here. We've got all of those Vesper geometries we're familiar with, some trigonal planar atoms, some tetrahedral atoms, all that fun stuff. And we're going to advance this guy to the calculation stage. So this is sort of our input, right? We've established where the atoms are located, the number of electrons in the molecule, and that there's a double bond between those two carbons on the end. The computational engine we use is not super important, but I'm going to select Gaussian so that we can do a natural bond orbitals calculation. This doesn't mention valence bond theory, but it's going to give us a essentially valence bond theoretical picture of the electrons in the molecule, and we'll be able to see the sigma and pi electrons very clearly with this. Give this a couple of seconds, and it should load up just fine. And we're already done, and we can hop in here now. All right, so the first thing I want to highlight with this is this idea of orbital overlap. All of the bonds that have been calculated for this molecule in this calculation are derived from the overlap of orbitals on adjacent atoms. So, for example, we can find C6 and C7 in the list of what this program calls natural hybrid orbitals. So we've got, um, for example, here, BD1, C6, C7. This is a hybrid orbital localized on carbon-6. It looks kind of like a wonky-looking P orbital, but you can imagine that if there's a similar orbital at carbon-7, there's going to be a huge area of overlap between the C6, C7 atoms in that bonding region between those two hybrids. And so, again, it's actually difficult in here for me to pull both of these up at the same time, but we can pull up the C7 hybrid orbital right here and see that, indeed, there's an equivalent hybrid localized to C7 with a huge area of overlap in the bonding region between C6 and C7. So the origin of the bond, in a sense, the bond is derived from the overlap of these atomic orbitals. And we'll dig into hybridization in another video, so don't worry about the shapes for the time being. Just recognize that in that bonding region, there's huge overlap between the atomic orbitals. And it's sigma-type overlap, and we can see that if we scroll down here to the natural bond orbitals and we look at the sigma bond between C6 and C7. So in this program, BD1, C6, C7, this description right here, BD1 in parentheses, C6, C7, refers to the sigma bond. And so if we tap on the magnifying glass here, take a look at this orbital, you'll notice that it just looks like a blob between the two atoms. There are regions of opposite phase on the outside of C6 and C7. But the important point I want to make now is if we rotate this and we look along the bonding axis so that the bonding axis is pointed directly into the screen, you can see that cylindrical or circular symmetry in this bonding orbital. It looks like a circle, right? If I come around to the other side, maybe it's a little bit easier to see. We can see a little bit of that tiny red nub in the backside of carbon-7. But we've got cylindrical symmetry there looking down the C6, C7 axis. That's the hallmark of a sigma bond. But there's another bond here. And we know from the previous video that this is going to be a pi bond. And so if I look at BD2 between carbon 6 and 7, what I'm going to see is a pi bond, hopefully. But let's click on it, take a look, and, and verify that. So if I look at BD2 between C6 and C7, now I've got a very different picture. In fact, uh, oh, I think I actually clicked on an atomic orbital there. Let's go to the bonding orbital, BD2, C6, C7. Yeah, that's more like it. All right. 
So this now, we've lost this circular or cylindrical symmetry. Notice if I turn this over, it's not going to look the same. The blue lobe will go on top and the red lobe on bottom. So I've lost that circular picture. This is qualitatively very different from the sigma bond. And notice that this comes from the overlap of two p orbitals aligned side by side, a familiar pi bonding picture, right? And so this is absolutely a pi bond. It looks kind of like a hot dog is how I think about it. If you think of the bonding axis as the hot dog itself, the, uh, the line or the stick connecting C6 and C7, the pi, the pi orbital looks like the buns of the hot dog, if you like. So this is the hallmark of a, a pi orbital. The second bond of a double bond and the second and third bonds of a triple bond are both pi orbitals or pi bonds, if you like. And after we've talked about hybridization, we'll see what happens in the case of a triple bond and how we can get two pi bonds between two triply bonded centers. So that's all I really wanted to highlight for the time being, um, is sigma and pi bonding in an actual calculation of a real molecule. This paradigm is still extremely important. You can find it in a wide variety of molecules with double and, and triple bonds, and it's still very much how we think about bonding. Perhaps there's one more thing to point out here, which is the relative energies of the sigma and pi bonding electrons. If you scroll back down to this table and again look at the bonding orbitals for, uh, between C6 and C7, one thing that we'll notice here is that the bond energy of the pi bond is quite a bit less negative than the bond energy for the sigma bond. So BD1 is at about negative one in these units. BD2 is only at about negative 0.37. And so the electrons in the pi bond are quite a bit higher in energy, quite a bit more reactive, we would infer, than the sigma bonding electrons. This is very typical, very common, very important paradigm. And of course, computational chemistry can help you get a handle on this and really see this in the results of calculations from the get-go. Now, the, the very last thing I'll mention is just a little bit about what's going on here under the hood. Something I haven't talked about yet is the fact that all of these bonding theories need to be at least qualitatively consistent with the Schrodinger equation. The Schrodinger equation, which we introduced for atoms and atomic orbitals, holds for molecules as well. And so what's happening behind the scenes here is that the program is calculating a set of bonding, and when we get to molecular orbital theory, what we'll call anti-bonding orbitals and non-bonding orbitals that is consistent with the molecular Schrodinger equation. That's essentially where these orbitals come from. We're not going to dig into the details of that in any way, shape, or form in this course, but I did want to mention it just to give you a sense of where things are coming from and what it's doing behind the scenes. It's basically making sure that the set of bonds that we get is consistent with the molecular Schrodinger equation.